Well, my family loves to go camping, and it's not just because every time we go, everything goes perfectly smooth and marvelous and is completely relaxing. I mean, sometimes uh, I like when that happens and when it's really relaxing, but sometimes it doesn't go just perfect. And yet, in the process, what happens? The family bonds, and we have stories for years to talk about and to laugh at, like... um, well, right after our wedding, Andrea and I, we, we decided to break out the wedding gifts of a tent and a few accessories for camping. And, and so we headed out, and we went in November to the Smoky Mountains. It, it got to like mid-30s, all right, and it rained all the time. And so we were there the, that first night sitting there. Our teeth were chattering. We did not hardly sleep a wink because we didn't have quite enough accessories yet. You know what I'm talking about. So we went hiking the next day and we came back and guess what? We were freezing. And about 15 minutes later after shivering, we looked at each other and said, this is ridiculous. We struck the campsite and we headed to Nashville for a nice warm, cozy hotel room. Uh, But we didn't learn there. We, We kept going like our last camping trip. And so we went out to Lake DeGray. It was a, couple, uh, a little while ago, about a month ago. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't get the campsite on the water that we wanted because, well, it was flooded. It was underwater. And so we couldn't go there, and we couldn't go to the beaches because they were flooded and they were closed. We couldn't go on a pass because every path we went on, guess what? It ended up in water. Uh, the fish weren't biting, but the twins got bit a ton of times from the fire ants. And Nate even got stung by a scorpion. Who knew there were even scorpions in Arkansas? I didn't. And to make things worse, in all of our years of camping, we have never had such horrible neighbors. Yes. Earlier this year, though, we had a camping trip, and it it had its good and it had its bad. It was down at, uh, well, the diamond, uh, the crater of the diamond spark. I don't know if you've ever been there, but have you ever noticed it's a nice place, but there is only one thing to do, period, nothing more, and that is to hunt for diamonds, which half the family was really cool with, and half the family, especially the in-laws who are with us, weren't, and, and so that was a bit crazy, but my oldest, Elizabeth, she is one of those girls that is crazy about it, because if there's even a hint of finding a treasure, she's all over this. Now, I heard that it was a good year to look and to find diamonds. That's what I heard. I'm still not convinced. (laughs) So my daughter would go down there in a second. I'd rather go somewhere where we can go fishing or hiking or just sitting and not get any fire bites, ants bites, you know, kind of thing. But then this last week, I read an article about this eight-year-old boy named Griffin. This eight-year-old boy named Griffin, he went to, uh, it was this place called Gold City Gem Mine in North Carolina where you can buy a bucket of dirt from the mine. So they get a bucket of dirt uh, with all of its stuff in there, and supposedly there is a chance that there might be a special hidden treasure in there, a gem from inside the mine. And so he bought his bucket of dirt, and he rifled through it all and and searched through that, and he found what everybody else found, which was a bunch of dirt and probably some pretty invaluable, uh, pretty messed up, you know, just ordinary rocks, except for this one. He grabbed this one rock out that he took home because he, or was going to take home because he thought it was like a really cool shape of sorts. And so he's walking through, and it, according to People Magazine, it was the lady that was at the, the, the jewelry counter there at the, at the, uh, the mine that, that looked at this rock and inspected it a little bit further. And what she found was that it was a 1,104 carat sapphire. It was worth more than $46,000. What a hidden treasure. This morning we finish up our series called Kings. It's a series where we've been taking a look at the people of Israel, God's people and their kings, the good, the bad, the ugly, and yet how through it all, even though it was a mess, God would work through it to bring the ultimate king of all. So we've looked at how in the beginning, God didn't want them to have a king. He only wanted them to look 
to him because he knew that if they had a king, that king was going to lead them astray, was going to take them in a whole different direction, but they insisted. So finally, they gave him a king. And so the last three weeks, we have been looking at the only three kings that kept the whole nation together. Started with Saul, a guy who started out pretty solid, uh, but soon he went south and he became this mean, demeaning, demanding, paranoid kind of king who didn't give God any glory or God's people any kind of peace. We went to David. Now, he was a little different. He was a man after God's own heart. He was this great example for us as followers of Jesus, how we can live our life with all that we have and all that we are. And yet his powers and his riches got to him, and he made a mess, a royal mess of his life. And yet even in that mess, he turned back to God in humility. A great example. Then last week we looked at Solomon, and Solomon was this faithful king that, that slowly had this heart that faded from being faithful because the very gifts and the very blessings that God himself gave him were things that, that drew his heart and the people, the nation of Israel's heart away from God. And so the result was that the nation fell apart. It was divided in two, and so you had Israel in the north, all right? And, and Israel would have 200 more years of being ruled by horrible, evil kings until finally they were captured and they were actually assimilated right into the Assyrians, never to be formed again. And then you had Judah on the, on the south who made it for 350 years, actually. Uh, most of their kings were not all that faithful to God, although some of them were, but most of them were downright evil. But there were a few. There were a few that were faithful to God that kept this remnant of God's people alive from which the ultimate king would come, which is Jesus. And one of those is a guy named Josiah, the king we're going to be looking at today. A king that even after the God's word, God's law, God's truth was hidden from God's people for generations, he found this hidden treasure that changed everything. So if you've got a Bible, pull it out. Turn with me to 2 Kings. We're going to spend most of our time in 2 Kings 22 and 23. If you've got a smartphone, you can head to a website where we have a uh, you can go to version right there, and you can actually follow along with the scripture, with the notes. You can take notes and so much more. So, so head to there. Now, in 2 Kings 22, we, we find this guy. We meet this guy named Josiah. He actually, he's a boy. He's eight years old. My daughter is about to turn eight. And so I was trying to think of this this last week. Elizabeth in charge of a nation. I mean, that is crazy. That would be like royal food of honey chicken from Payway and you know, Chick-fil-A all the time. It would have this vast array of, of, of treats all the time. The most important decisions would be which wall to paint pink and which wall to paint purple, right? Now, Josiah, you would think, would be even worse than that because he comes from this majorly dysfunctional family. His grandfather was Mensiah. This guy was evil to the nth degree. He did despicable kind of things. I mean, he was into witchcraft. He was in divination. He even sacrificed one of his sons to a false god named Baal. Horrible guy. And in the light of what this grandfather did, God cast judgment upon his people. In fact, we see this in chapter 21, verse 14. Here's what God says. I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and give them into the hands of enemies. They will be looted and plundered by all the enemies. They have done evil in my eyes and have aroused my anger from the day their ancestors came out of Egypt until this day. And actually, in a number of decades, that's exactly what happened. Josiah's dad, on the other hand, he wasn't all that much better. Problem is he was around really corrupt people. So his own entourage within two years turned on him and killed him. And in the, in, in the whole process, they were also put to death. And so here's this eight-year-old boy that is put into this position of being king. We don't learn a whole lot about the first couple of years of his life, but in 2 Chronicles, we actually see how even as a teenager, he turns away from the gods of his grandfather and his dad and actually turns to the God 
of David to Yahweh. And then by the 20s, his 20s, he is now already trying to clean up the nation, including God's temple that had been destroyed. And we pick it up in verse, uh, chapter 22, verse 8. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who, who read it. And then just, just Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robe. He gave these orders, go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all of Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. God's word was lost, which was probably all or, or the vast majority of the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, which is the story of God's, of God's love, the story of God's promise, his covenant, and the story of God's law, which set those people apart, and it was lost. Which I don't know about you, but how did they lose it? I mean, have you ever thought about that? I mean, there, there are priests here. Hilkiah's a priest to Yahweh, and he doesn't have God's word. <laughs> what was he doing? What was he looking at? And then yet, I start to think about it, and, and today we have more of God's word, right? We have the whole story. We, we don't only have the promises of a Savior. We have the fact that the, the account of how Jesus came to fulfill that promise, how he came to fulfill the promises and the covenant that God gave to us to save us. And yet as we look out at this world around us, it's not all that much different. God's word is lost to much of this world. Many people have no idea what's, what's in this. Uh, and many people don't want to have anything to do with this. There are even some people that are adamantly opposed to what is in here because it talks in black and white in a world that is full of gray. It talks about absolute truth in the midst of a world where truth is, is not really politically correct. And so they think that this has no meaning on you or me, or anyone else. And yet, that's pretty easy to, to point to people outside, isn't it? And look at that and say that that's how they are. And yet, we look at our people even inside the church, people who so-called are spiritual people, who have, and, and we realize that they too have lost God's word. You know, many of us just go through the motions because that's what we're supposed to do. And Christian, Christian or Christianity just becomes some kind of title, some kind of ethnicity, some kind of, I don't know, club that we, we have instead of a reality and a truth that, that actually defines and shapes who we are, who molds who we have become and helps us see our eternity. And so instead of taking God's word out and digging into it, letting it convict us and move us and transform us, we just leave it on the shelf or as a decoration on some kind of end table, don't we? Because then we don't have to come face to face with it. It doesn't have to convict me. It doesn't have to challenge me. It doesn't have to move my cheese. As a pastor, I've heard this too. I've even heard it in this place. I mean, why... Why can't we just go to the good stuff? You know, why can't we just skip all that, that gloom and doom and just jump to the good stuff? Why do we have to point out how bad we are, or how messed up this world has become? Why, do, why can't we just hear the happy stuff? I think the reason we, 
we, we come to those conclusions. The reasons we, we do this is because even you and me, we have this tendency of keeping God's word at kind of this arm's length away from us. And we might know the highlights. We might know some of the good stuff. We might know the stories that we learned from, uh, about when we were a kid. We might know all the stuff that kind of makes us feel good. Um, but we don't really dive in much deeper than that. God's word isn't all fluffy because life isn't all fluffy. And, and the, the thing is, is the real treasure, the real gem isn't found without our desperate need for what this actually offers. Which, which I mean is that the greatest treasure of all is found in this place right here, in God's word. But if God's word is all good news, then we wouldn't understand our need for the good news. So as you dive into this, it, it ends up convicting you and moving your cheese. It ends up redefining and, and who you are and turning your priorities upside down. It rearranges your approach to life and to love. It shapes and molds you as a person. See, we aren't just supposed to love God. We're supposed to love God with all we are and all we have. We aren't just in need of Jesus. We are desperately in need of Jesus because he's the only answer because we're infected with this thing called sin. This thing called sin that, that causes me to, to blow up at the people I love the most, even my kids. This thing called sin that causes me to go through life making decisions about um, how is this gonna serve me instead of what's right or wrong or good. This thing called sin that ends up making me disappoint others all the time and myself. This thing called sin that, that ends up making me limited and frail and ends up making me fail. Josiah heard God's law. He heard God's word. And his eyes were open to the fact that his family, that his nation, that he himself had run away from this God who was a God of love, a God of faithfulness, a God of blessing. And then all of a sudden he realized what he had done, what they had done. And do you know what his first reaction was? He tore his ropes. Which, I don't know, that's, that's probably not our first reaction, but in those days that was, that was this huge sign of repentance and humility, which, by the way, is exactly the goal of this. See, the reason that, that we have the tough stuff in here, the bad news stuff in here, is so that we will repent. See, God doesn't want to... <laughs> He doesn't want to depress you. He doesn't want a whole bunch of depressed kind of people. He doesn't want to crush you. And yet, sometimes we need a bit of crushing for us to finally turn and repent and realize we need Jesus. See, God's law, its number one goal is to help us to turn back to Jesus, to point out our sin, and our need for him, so that through Jesus we might find this hidden treasure to this world this greatest gift of all, which is grace through Jesus Christ. That somehow we would turn to the greatest king of all, not, not kings that are people or stuff out in this world, but to Jesus. See, our, our biggest issue is that no matter who you are, you're, you're, you probably fall in the trap that I do. That, that at times we get... Bought, we buy into this lie that, that somehow I'm, I'm not the, all that bad. You know, you, you look in the news and there was a guy who was arrested in Conway for, um, for, for murder. I, I'm nowhere be, as bad as that guy, right? You watch through the, the newspapers and you see about some politician that's corrupt. I'm not like that. You sit down every single night at 10 o'clock watching the news and you see this criminal and that, and it's easy to say, hey, I'm not so bad. But the Bible's clear that we are all messed up. 
The Bible's clear that we all have issues, that we are all infected with this thing called sin. And the sin creates this huge gap between us and God. And it's not about us trying a little harder. It's not about us getting a little better. It's about us finally giving up and giving in to Jesus. You know, I, I heard it once described this way that God's standard is perfection. What God wants is us to keep his law completely. And, and the fact of the matter is even Mother Teresa and Desmond Tutu or whoever you want to say, they are nowhere near keeping that to perfection. Nowhere near. In, in fact, God's perfection is, is impossible for anybody to to reach. Even the greatest humanitarian in the world is like me throwing this rock from here to the North Pole. Now, don't get me wrong. I played Little League a lot of years back when I was a kid, and, and I got an arm, all right? And, and I, in track as a kid, I threw softball and shot put. So I can throw this a long way, but I'm not sure I could even throw this to Markham Street let alone thousands of more miles. And, and even if I worked all my life, day and night, and trained really hard, it would be absolutely impossible for me to throw this to North Little Rock, let alone to the North Pole. Impossible. And that's what it's like for us to save ourselves. It's impossible. You can work all your life, and you're still thousands and thousands of miles short. God's law crushes us and points out our need. The fact that we are, we're desperate, that we have absolutely no other answer, no other solution. There's nothing other than Jesus. I can't throw this rock to the North Pole unless Jesus takes this rock and does it for me. I can't keep God's law perfectly unless Jesus comes in and takes the mess in my life and, and he takes my sin and, and my condemnation and he takes it and he takes it to the cross and dies for it. And that's exactly what he's done for you and for me. See, when the rest of the world looks at this, this bucket of dirt and cheap rocks they think it's something that gets in the way of life, something that puts boundaries around you or, or something like that. But what we know is that this is the treasure and the truth that changes everything. This is the thing that points out our need for Jesus, but then reminds us that we have been forgiven and won over by Jesus. This is the thing that gives us grace to this life and peace to the chaos of this life, and purpose to a life that doesn't know where to go. This gives us Jesus. If you've got a Bible, turn real quick to John 15. In John 15, Jesus, um, actually throughout the book of John, he paints pictures over and over again for us to understand, these illustrations for us to understand our relationship with him. And in John 15, he gives this, this picture to us. We're just going to read one verse, verse 5. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart, of me, apart from me, you can do nothing. So a little over a month ago, um, I was working in our yard, and if you've ever been uh, around our yard, you know that there's a lot of trees, and, and around the trees there's bushes, and there's vines going up the bushes and stuff. So I had an ax out, and I was um, working all that stuff, pulling some of that stuff out, and, and then find out um, that some of that was poison oak. So then I had like four weeks of itching. It was horrible. But anyway, so I never got back out there to clean up all that stuff, so there were some vines that were still climbing up the, the, the tree, but where I had cut off those branches, those leaves, those everything, they had withered up and died. And what Jesus says is that without him, that's what you and I are like. If we aren't connected with God, if we're not connected with Jesus, we're withering up and dying. 
We need to be connected to Jesus. We need to be in his word, learning his truth, being reminded that we mess up and that we need him and that we're set free by him. We need to be in a place like this where, where we have this community of other people that can walk with us through life and, and help us to remain in Jesus. That's what we need. Well, Josiah's story is such a great story because he goes on and he helps a, a whole nation discover this hidden treasure, God's word. In fact, turn back to 2 Kings, now chapter 23, verse 1. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He read in the hearing of of all the words of the book of the covenant, which he had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and, and keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves back to the covenant. And Josiah goes down in the records as being this faithful and bold king. Because he found God's word and his covenant and he shared it with all those that were under his command. And in the process he turned this whole nation around, well, for a little while. You can keep reading to find out how they then became unfaithful again. But Josiah goes down, look at what the the records say. Verse 25, neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord and as he did, with all his heart and with all his soul, with all his strength, in accordance with all the laws of Moses. So we may not be a king. It may be unpopular and definitely politically incorrect, incorrect. But as people who've been convicted by God's law yet freed by Christ's grace and connected to Jesus, we have a job to do. We have a message of hope to share. First, for those that are in a direct influence under us, like our our kids, our grandkids, our our family, Uh, but then also those people that God puts into our path to share them the hidden treasure that is in God's word, the fact that we desperately need Jesus And that Jesus grants us the freedom, the grace, the only answer, the only solution. That they too can find the King of Kings, the Lord of Lord, that gives forgiveness for this life and the promise of a so much greater kingdom to come. They can find Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we admit there are times that, um, that we kind of fade from your word. There are times that, that we allow this idea of being your child as just being something that, that is a title. There are times that we're not in your word. And we, we, we pray, Lord, that, that we would see the treasure that you have given us through your word and how it works through your spirit to convict our hearts and change us and mold us and shape us as people. Dear Jesus, I pray that you would help us, just like Josiah, to make that covenant with you through your spirit. And in the process, Lord, to be be your mouthpiece to the world around us so that they can find this treasure that only comes to grace in Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen.